You're listening to From the Chair, and I'm your host, Mike Hamilton. Join us each episode as we talk to athletic directors from across America. We're going to talk about topics like leadership, career development, issues of the day, and I can promise you we're going to have some fun along the way, too. So sit back, listen in, and let's dive in. Let's go. All right, welcome into today's episode. This will be a good one. We've got the legendary, the first ballot Hall of Famer, Athletic Director at the University of Oklahoma, Joe Casiglione today. Joe, how are you doing, man? Well, outside of that effusive praise, I'm doing, I don't deserve that, by the way, Mike, but I'm doing well. And hey, you know, you call this from the chair, so why not have me sitting in the chair? I mean, I think I'm trying to play to the title of this podcast. There you are, man. Well, hey, uh, you um, are you hold a distinction in that you are the longest tenured athletic director in the Power Five, maybe in the FBS, but certainly in the Power Five, starting there at Oklahoma in 98 after um, coming over from the University of Missouri. So that's 25 years at Oklahoma. And these jobs, as you know, uh, I don't know the latest facts, Joe, but the, the average tenure of an athletic director in the Power Five these days is probably, what, four or five, six years. And so to have the staying power that you've had at Oklahoma, um, and I know you will, you will obviously give credence to the, the institution and the, the presidential leadership and those kinds of things. But I am interested, um, you know, your reflections on 25 years at, at Oklahoma and sort of like, how do you feel like, what's been the, what have been the three or four keys to being there the length of time that you have been? Well, oddly enough, um, there's a level of consistency and continuity uh, that has helped us uh, in so many ways move the program forward. I got a chance to work with the president that hired me originally for about 20 years of my 25 years here at Oklahoma. So there's, um, there's something to be said for that because obviously presidents don't normally stay in those positions as long as that as long as uh, David Boren did, um, who hired me back in 98. But uh, the other side of it sounds a little contradictory, but is uh, being being uh, in a position where you could think over the horizon, around the corner, uh, obviously be you know visionary as much as you're trying to take care of the matters of the day, and position Oklahoma to be a program that either causes change to occur or to be able to be nimble enough uh, and flexible enough to adapt to change. And boy, if that approach hasn't served us um, well previously, we are certainly get a full dose of it the last couple of years, the way we've had to navigate college athletics going forward. So I'd say is a combination of the two factors. And, and as you mentioned, uh, no one ever does this by themselves. I don't care how much credit one person gets. And, uh, more than just, you know, me sounding humble, it is truly a, a level of humility that allows us to have the culture and the kind of program that is focused on getting better every day because you put your people first. And for us, it's always going to be about student athletes, number one. And then uh, obviously the people that work with them every day uh, are just as important because you want to position them to serve athletes as, as best we can and make this the the destination of choice for the best and the brightest. So I've been very lucky to be around a lot of good people and uh, really work together to make special things happen. Mm. You know, there's a lot, of, there's some chatter in the marketplace over the winter of, of a, one particular school having this sort of public debate. Are we a football school? Are we a basketball school? We're an everything school. And, and certainly, Oklahoma was known for, for many, many years as, as one of the powers, in, and, and still so, by the way, in college football. Um, but what I, I always tell folks, I think there are a small handful of athletic directors that have done nothing short of a masterful job of making sure that all of their programs are relevant and consistent and achieving national, regional and national success. And I, I come from that school. Uh, Bob Woodruff, who uh, predated Doug Dickey, and obviously I followed Doug Dickey, said if it's, if it's worth having, if, if you're going to have the program, then it's worth competing and winning in that program, right, to give its full support. I think you're from that school. Just, you know, the evolution of how you've tried to make sure that all of your sports are performing at an elite level, giving them the appropriate uh, resources to be successful. 
love to hear your thoughts on that. It's noticeable, 100%. by the way. What's that? I said it's noticeable. That's why I'm calling it out. Well, thank you, but I, I, uh, I embrace that a hundred percent. Really, it sounds like I read the same book or I was influenced by the same people, and I, I really believe that. It, it starts with our why. I know you hear this from all of the people that you interview. This is um, there's a there's a reason why we do what we do because we're driven by the why. How we can put people in a great position to be successful, how we can pour into them, how we create the resources, how we understand what some of their dreams and passions are and align everything we're doing, as long as it's obviously in alignment with what the institution wants or expects. And um, I, you know, I, I think you know the part that really hits me more every time it happens is when I'm meeting athletes face to face, whether it's one on one or a group, and you look into their eyes and you understand what they're trying to do and how they're trying to do it and all the pressures that they face and the opportunities that they have. And uh, you treat them fairly and equitably um, because they they have such gifts that they want to share with the rest of the world. And, you know, that we understand and they understand, even without talking about it, that schools that have large football programs, uh, that they're the economic engine for the rest of the athletic program. But that doesn't mean it takes away from their own experience. In fact, if anything, it adds to it and allows them to uh, maybe have some things they wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, so everybody understands the, the, uh, the whole setting, but we look across and we measure. These are things that we evaluate all the time. You know, how are we investing in each of our sports? How are we investing in the people around the sports? You know, what we spend on recruiting to get the best of the, and brightest athletes here. What do their facilities look like? How do they compare? How do they travel? You know, the, obviously with the changing in legislation, how are we handling nutrition and mental health and uh, recovery and strength and conditioning, academic support, all, all of those things that pour into um, their experience because we want our athletes to come to Oklahoma and say it's the best decision they ever could have made for their current and future life and that they wouldn't trade it for anything else. And, Hopefully they've uh, won some championships while they're here because that's the fun of competing and uh, competing at a place like Oklahoma. But uh, we also want them to feel that their biggest championship is the one they won for themselves in their growth, how they completed their degree, how they grew as people, how they become more prepared for the world, whether it includes sport beyond their time here at Oklahoma or not. And so they look back and say, I just, I'm better for being at Oklahoma. So that matter, um, men's or women's athletes, we're always trying to understand what they need and make sure we can provide it. Mm. I'm going to circle back to student athletes in just a minute because I want to ask a couple of key questions on that. But you referenced a little bit about culture and personnel, and, and I, I'm, I'm thinking about the head coaching hires for a moment. But if you folks who uh, folks know this, you have – but done an unbelievable job of uh, hiring not only coaches, but certainly in, in key administrators. And a number of those have gone on to athletic director roles. And, and Joe, I don't even know what the number is today. My hunch is probably north of 15, maybe 20, uh, maybe more. I don't know. But I just, just in a short list that off the top of my head right now would be like Zach Selman, Michael Offord, Jeff Long, Kirby Hocutt, Brandon Martin, uh, Matt Roberts, Nikki Moore, you know, that's just, a, and that's just off the top of my head, right? And if I think about those folks, they all have incredible strength in their own right. They all have had success. Rick Hart's another one, by the way. They've all had success where they are. Um, and they're, but they're different, you know? And so I'm curious, and let's relate this not only to the hires of those leaders, but also maybe your, your coaching hires who have had success as well. Tell me how you evaluate talent in the administrator role and in the head coaching role, uh, knowing that everybody's different, right? I, I'm interested in how you, you've done, you've had a lot of success in that. Well, thank you. Yeah, I um, I don't know if I'd throw our podcast into a downward spiral, but right over to uh, um, my right, 
in, in your left is uh, a wall and uh, it has ball caps uh, of all the um, of schools or conferences because I have two conference commissioners that are in the midst of that. Uh, Keith Gill, the commissioner at the Sun Belt, and Gloria Navarre is the new commissioner of the Mountain West Conference. But uh, yeah, it's nearly 30. Um, wow. A little more than 25 that have um, I've hired, um, but I have some others that I've mentored for probably as long as they've been into the business, even if they didn't work directly for me for one way, shape, or form or relationship that got started. Um, but from the hiring standpoint is, is obviously looking first at what a, um, an organization needs. You know, I, I haven't always tried to find um, a uh, perfect fit because I don't know that there's ever a perfect fit. Now we might use that phrase and we might feel that amongst all the other candidates, they're the best fit, but it's more what we need at the time that they were the right fit. And um, sometimes even my own staff would question, why did you hire this person with this background or this skill set? Is because I had to look at the organization and see what we needed going forward, not what we needed right this minute. And so it, it wasn't always a plug and play kind of concept, at least from a staffing standpoint. And I, I look at um, obviously the core competencies and skills that they bring, but their own vision for their personal and professional growth and how we can align that with our needs and getting to be better and be different. Um, we know we have to, like we said at the beginning, be able to uh, you know, certainly understand the foundation upon which we're built and the things that need to stay as strong as possible, but we have to understand we work in a, in a business that is going to do one thing and that's going to change. And so uh, we want to be able to be at the forefront of all of that, whether it's leading or adapting. And so I want to find people that are sort of got that DNA inside them. So it's a combination, Mike, of, of EQ and IQ. And so we got competency and, and their character. Uh, and I, I'd say that I would go over to the coaching as well, because um, many of the coaches that I've hired, quite candidly, are first time head coaches. And um, I, I know there's an inherent risk with that, but we also look at what the program needs, obviously who um, we may be able to hire at the moment. And coaching searches are always very interesting because when they occur, sometimes you have a lead up to it and sometimes you don't, but everybody has their idea and their favorite coach that they think should be hired. And for whatever reason, limited as it might be, um, but they don't understand all the other dynamics. And you know this from your own experiences as an AD, they just don't know the other dynamics involved in um, hiring or, you know, many cases recruiting the next coach, you know, they, it's not like when they hire a dean of a college or even a university president, they take three to six months, you know, to have these big committees and, you know, everybody goes through a process and they narrow it down. And sometimes you could bring them on campus and put them in front of other people. You know, you don't get to do that with coaches searches. Uh, you're, you're a lot of times doing that in a um, very compressed time frame and uh, trying to do it uh, away from the public eye because we know some of the best and brightest don't want to be um, too visible in the event that they're not selected. And so uh, you have all these different dynamics and characteristics and techniques and art to a, ser a search and having to do it in a very short amount of time and have it to be as right as you could possibly make it. Um, whether people think you should win the press conference or not, you've got to find the right person that's going to win for your program in the long run. And um, I've really, really tried to do what I think is best um, in others, you know, that are involved in the search that, uh, you know, binds an athletic department in a university, because as we know, Mike, you can share this, so we can go out and hire coaches, but 
you know, that also binds the university contractually. So there are others that are involved in, in the uh, selection process, even if they're not involved in the, the grind of the search, no matter how many days it might take to find the right person. Um, so that means the president or the board, you know, all of those uh, have to be involved in making that kind of decision because it's not just a uh, philosophical one, but it's a business one. So, you know, over time, we've been able to have a pretty good track record for that. And I'm something I'm very proud. And I always say this to any coach that um, I hire, that once you go to work for me or for us, you know, at a university, I immediately go to work for you because I, I do see it in, in a number of ways as a true partnership, because if the coach is successful, we're all going to be successful. Mm, that's good stuff. You know, I was, I was talking to AD the other day. In fact, I was one of these podcasts and we were talking about characteristics of coaches. And I, I asked, you know, what stands out for them? Is it mentor, who their mentors were, you know, their geographic affiliation, uh, interest in the, you know, have they been an alum of the school? You know, what, have, where have they been before? How did they win? You know, uh, technical skill, recruiting plan, and et cetera, et cetera. And this AD said, at the end of the day, uh, they believe that the most important characteristic after all the searches they've done was intelligence, you know? And I, you know, that can take on a lot of meanings, but, but I, I thought that was actually a great call out because these jobs are so complex that you have to have some level of intellect because you're not just coaching, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're coaching, you're selling, you're recruiting, uh, you're, you're delegating, uh, all those kinds of things. And I think the coaching, the coaching, uh, chair has become more and more complex, um, over the last 10 or 15 years for certain, you know, and, uh, with the pressures that have come with social media, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you you've, you've had a great track record and, and I'm, I have no doubt that intelligence is one of those characteristics that you've hired to. Well, no doubt. And, you know, I could pick a number of individual characteristics, if you will. I mean, all of those things you mentioned obviously are part of it. Um, but I'd also add one other characteristic and that's genuine confidence these are tough jobs and we can't uh we can't always determine when adversity is going to strike or how your uh, coach is going to handle uh, issues that might develop with student athletes or um, their own staff um, how the pressures of the job you know i i want somebody that has genuine confidence not false bravado but genuine confidence, not arrogance, genuine confidence. Yeah. And uh, I've noticed the difference when I'm talking to a prospective coach and they say, well, here's my five-year plan. And I said, well, that's all good, but I need to know what your one-year plan is, and then your two-year, <laughs> and then your three-year. We may not be around long enough to see the five-year plan develop. I get it. I, we have visions and we know certain things take a little longer period of time and we're not a win at all costs program by any stretch but um i don't really i don't really respond well to people that start talking about all all that they want to do but putting conditions on it before they even have the job <laughs> uh yeah. we want we want somebody that knows what they're getting into and sometimes you get that with sitting head coaches as much as you would get it with a first time head coach so you know, I, I have also spent some time, like a lot of my colleagues, and I know I could probably speak for you too, Mike, because I know you've done it, but um, we get asked to be involved in mentoring prospective coaches and trying to help them prepare for the eventual point in time where they do get job interviews to become head coaches. And these are the kinds of things that we help them understand uh, that they're going to face in the interview process. and because I've faced it, you know, doing the actual interview for hiring and it helps them be more prepared about what their first, you know, 30 days, 90 days and, and beyond would look like so they can, you know, create the right foundation starting out or, you know, in some cases they're walking into a good situation. So they, you know, be able to build upon the foundation that's already there, even if it's going to be, you know, a little different program under their leadership. So I, I think it all works together. Mm. 
All right. So I, I said I was going to circle back to student athletes. And I am, by the way, those who are listening, I know you expect me to act, ask about the SEC move. I'm going to get there. But I, I want to I've got one more question on, on this front. Um, you know, you have a big job, Joe, and you've got a lot of constituents and a lot of uh, masters you have to serve, so to speak, board of trustees, you know, uh, student athletes, uh, parents, donors, you know, et cetera, so state legislators, you know, whatever. Um, but I, I would contend that probably the most important constituent base of, of any athletic director is ultimately the student athlete. And you do have a, a very complex job that pulls you in a million different directions. And particularly when you're leading a big organization like the University of Oklahoma Athletic Department is, you have to be really cautious and cognizant of, of not getting pulled too far away from the core mission of the athletic program. And I'm, I'm really in, interested uh, as, you know, over your career um, and now more specifically, how do you maintain an ear to the ground, the relationships with student athletes to be adept at being able to speak to what the core needs are of a student athlete that comes to Oklahoma? It's all about communication, uh, both with uh, the staff that interact with athletes on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, that doesn't just be limited to your own leadership team. They're part of it. But uh, listening to trainers, listening to now, in a case, our mental health spe specialists, uh, listening to those that work with them in strength and conditioning, and obviously listening to the coaches that are around them, recruit them, and uh, lead them on a day-to-day -day basis. and not last, but most importantly, directly with the athletes themselves. And I do meet with them on a periodic basis. I'm not trying to meet with them every day or, you know, multiple times during the week. But, you know, some of it you get, you know, a sense when you visit practices or if you get to travel with them or you get to see them. You know, sometimes I sit down with athletes of other sports at other sporting events, you know, that they might be there supporting another team, supporting their friends. You see them in the stands and you could sit with them. We're watching volleyball together. We're watching a basketball team to get a game together. It might be uh, baseball or softball or whatever. You, you see them and you get a chance to interact with them. And uh, it's not that you're trying to put them under a microscope every time you uh, talk to them, but you build a relationship. And then I also have um, a group of athletes that I meet with uh, several times a semester that represent all of the sports. So it's, it's uh, uh, I, I call it the captain's table. And um, we basically, you know, there's two things. One, we talk about, you know, what's on their mind and the issues that concern them. But also the other part is how I can pour into them to help them be better captains, be better leaders. So I bring in guest speakers for um, for them to, to hear. I'm very mindful now of the limited number of hours we can be around athletes. I certainly understand the CARA and RARA and all the rules that relate to um, meetings that we require of them. So we really want to minimize that. But it's just trying to pour into them in such a way and listen to them. So what we are pouring into them hits the targets, the that serve them the most. So it's all rooted in communication. And those are just some of the examples that I, I try to use that are, are ready and available at our fingertips. Hmm. All right. So let's flip to the SEC move. Um, you, you uh, obviously made a very high profile move to, um, to, to join the Southeastern conference and that's coming up now more quickly than it was originally scheduled. I know you have great respect for the schools in the big 12 and your colleagues in the big 12 and you want to, to uh, continue to to do all you can to be helpful with the Big 12 in your remaining time there, and and uh, how much you value those friendships, you as an institution, uh, you guys are taking the next step. Obviously, there are a number of institutions around the country that are doing this as well with the, the, the evolution of conferences, right? And this question, you probably expect me to ask why the move to the SEC, and maybe we'll come back to that. But I'm actually more intrigued now that you are making this move. And it has such significant and far-reaching implications on recruiting and budgets and um, you know, marketing and you know, logos on fields and all those kind of things. And I'm, I think I maybe actually saw you comment on this in the last couple of days. 
but I'm, I'm curious as to how you guys have gone about your planning for tr transition, knowing that that's a big hairball. <laughs> it is. And it's a tricky balance because as you said, Mike, we want to be very mindful, respectful, uh, and aware of the massive challenge we have right now in competing in a great conference of the big 12. Uh, look at, we're in the midst of a lot of different seasons for that matter, but, uh, this basketball league at the moment is it may be unprecedented. I don't know that there's ever been this many teams with this many high level wins and including a lot against each other. It's just, and we've always said it's a gauntlet to, to play in a lot of conferences and, and it is, but you know, you have to be respectful and, um, you know, certainly uh, all in to try to help our programs be successful in the big 12 while we're here and uh, respect our, our uh, sister institutions, which we have healthy respect for and, and work, like you said, for the conference in, in its best interests. And we've been doing that as well. But we have to also prepare now for what is an eventuality in moving into the SEC. And we started uh, immediately once we um, applied for membership, putting together a, a strike team, if you will, um, assessing, uh, comparing, uh, gaining greater understanding of, you know, the key elements that we're going to have to find a way to address or uh, educate or have better understanding about what we're facing um, before we get there. We're not waiting till the year we join to start thinking about those kinds of things. And so we've had an SEC readiness team working internally, and I won't go to all of the subjects, but um, start thinking about the um, impact of the future conference schedule, travel, what that might mean. We're not just going to new places, but uh, different distances, you know, so uh, what that might mean versus a bus ride and a charter air and all the cost implications of that. You know, how do our staffs, you know, compare to each? Uh, and you do that as a sport by sport comparison. Uh, Facilities, obviously, you know, both for practice and competition. We have to understand that there are different rules or expectations in one conference over the other. So getting through all of that and trying to identify what those are and understanding what we might need to do to adjust. As an example, you know, we have learned, you know, some of the seating configurations for SEC member institutions and how and where they position students as opposed to where you know the visiting team might be standing or sitting and you know we're have different rules in the big 12 so you're gonna have to adjust you know to that um so you can go on and on and on you know to the other areas um budgetary implications um not just income but expenses related to joining and the fact that we want to be successful and we did that on our own. And then, Mike, the, the next thing we did, which was uh, which was and has continued to be a lot of fun, is I talked to my counterpart, Chris Del Conte, at Texas, and they were putting together a very similar group, you know, to study the transition. And so we've brought the two staffs and the subcommittee chairs together, and we've met in Dallas once and to kind of introduce everybody and kind of share our findings and what we're seeing. And uh, we're going to do this again. But in the meantime, the subcommittee groups have been talking to each other because while we're in competition, you know, on the fields or the courts or the tracks or wherever, uh, this is something we're going to be facing together. And yeah, I know that sounds a little crazy when you're talking about you're doing it with your your most heated rival. But uh, there's there's a lot to be gained that we can share and not try to reinvent the wheel twice and uh, learn from each other and be better prepared. So we're, um, we're both uh, great contributing members when we join the SEC. But again, we're trying to make sure we keep the main thing the main thing and focus on uh, that important balance of being successful in the Big 12 while we're here. I will add one other thing that we've, add, we've started here at Oklahoma, and that's a similar committee outside our department. So we, uh, we have a subcommittee called Team Norman, 
and they're dealing with everything from uh, ingress, egress to town, to airports, to lodging, to the way our city presents itself, to how we're going to serve new fans coming in. Um, just, you know, a lot of things under the sun that we've engaged a lot of civic leaders. So uh, they're thinking about it, which, you know, they not naturally are, but thinking and doing are two different things. And so yeah. we wanted to make sure we have a, a way to activate the, uh, the um, plans to adjust and, and be ready for uh, when we do join. So uh, that's going to be great. And you're going to develop some new rivals, obviously, in, in the competition, seeing fans from different institutions that maybe you're accustomed to will be fun. And I know one of your, your traditions is when you're on the road, you, you have what's called the breakfast club. And uh, where you, you go find a place in the local community, uh, maybe just share a, a quick second on that, a couple of minutes on that, Joe. Uh, I think it's awesome. I've actually been with you to a couple of locations. I mean, last year or two years ago, I think it was, we went to the uh, Eat Breakfast Big 12 tournament in Kansas City, right? So maybe do you have a favorite uh, at the risk of, you know, forming some bias that you may not want to share? Or, or what, what's the breakfast club for those who don't know? Well, it all started when well, we all have to eat a pregame meal, right? Somewhere. <laughs> and uh, it all started oh, years and years ago, even back when I was, uh, uh, you know, during my days at the University of Missouri, um, where we, we get on the road and try to find the best local breakfast spot. Now, uh, unless it's the only thing available, we will not go to a chain restaurant. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we, we have because, again, that was the only thing available, but that's not the goal. We're trying to find the best local diner, cafe. Um, you know, we started doing this before Guy Fieri started doing his, uh, <laughs> his uh, show on the Food Network. And maybe I should be a partial contributor to his show because I know a few that maybe he hasn't visited. Well, but, that could be um, also a new show on the SEC Network, by the way. <laughs> it very well could be. Um, yeah. In fact, I've kidded a few people that do shows that, hey, maybe we need a segment here. Uh, Andy Staples is a good friend from, we're both foodies, you know, like that. Yeah. But uh, in any event, that's how it started. And then um, a couple of us, you know, sort of attracted a few more and a few more and a few more now, you know, in some of our, our, uh, our uh, breakfast gatherings on the road, it includes fans. And I've engaged with fans that, some have uh, traveled in from, I have one in West Virginia that drove up from Florida to go to the, you know, the game day pregame breakfast and sat with you know, some of our staff that have gotten accustomed to this. And uh, I feel like it's a part of um, enjoying what America has to offer because you meet new people, you meet the owners of some of these uh, breakfast spots, cafe, diner, you get to interact with people. And some of it's even more fun when you, they, you do it and they don't even know who you are, but you hear them talk about whatever their perception might be of an issue of the day, the university, whatever. And uh, I've had some stories, we don't have enough time here, but uh, some amazing stories that uh, we've, we've gathered over, over a lot of those years. So uh, yeah, I'll do it every game day. Um, don't do it a lot at home games, obviously, because I have so many other responsibilities and uh, you know, sometimes we're over here at the stadium very early, but on the road, I'll be finding that place. And uh, obviously when we, uh, even this year, we have four new institutions at the Big 12. So we may be traveling to some places we haven't been previously, but when we join the SEC, I'll uh, be looking for those special places. I've already had a few people that I know start to send me some, some good suggestions. So I look forward to trying those as well. That's awesome. Hey, well, look, I, I didn't get to about half my questions, Joe. That may surprise you uh, because I knew it'd be a great conversation among friends. And I do appreciate the the years that we've had as a, as friends. Like, gosh, I think it goes back to the early 90s, maybe. And the, the chance to be colleagues in the industry, uh, to bat around ideas, to share thoughts on coaches and administration and leaders and future leaders and all those kinds of things. Um, you're my relationship with you has been one of the things I've cherished uh, about being in college athletics. And I do think that's one of the things that makes college athletics special is the opportunity to develop unique 
relationships and friendships where where you all may be competitors on the field, but off the field, uh, you're trying to to you know advance the ball, so to speak, with with people that you care about and that you know share a common interest, right? So, uh, really want to say thank you for being with me today. It's mean that means a lot. Well, Mike, thank you for having me on, and I know a lot of uh, our friends and colleagues have been. Um, been guests on your podcast and uh, I appreciate the relationship that I have with them all as well as the new people I meet in business. I try to help people like people help me um, when I was coming up and uh, there's a few of us that were probably all century all lobby team members because we were <laughs> chasing down the best leaders in athletics at the time trying to learn from them and I don't know what I could offer, but if there's ever anything that I can, and I, I feel like it's uh, not just a responsibility, but a, a, you know, quite candidly, an honor and a privilege, you know, to be able to share. So helping somebody be um, be better at what they're trying to do that's a that's a real honor. So um, hope maybe there's a few nuggets in the time we spent together today, and um, look forward to seeing you a lot more, as I know well, I will. Look- it, you provided more than a few nuggets. It's great, great stuff. In fact, I, I look forward to Joe Castiglione version two that we're going to have to record here in maybe six months down the road or something. Okay. That, that'll be the, we'll, we'll, we'll mark that down when, uh, when we get into maybe the fall or next spring. So um, again, today, folks, you've been listening to from the chair. I'm your host, Mike Hamilton, uh, our distinguished guest, Joe Castiglione, the director of athletics at the university of Oklahoma. One of the great ones. We hope you'll listen uh, to this podcast each and every week on all the audio audio platforms that you may choose to, to listen to or to view it right here on the YouTube channel as well. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.